Now, mining technology to solve the world's problems. NewsHour economics correspondent Paul Salmon recently traveled to California and filed this report on some innovative thinkers. It's part of his ongoing reporting, Making Sense of Financial News. On the back lot at 20th Century Fox, the world of make-believe. And a typical make-believe vision of the future, courtesy of Fox CEO Jim Giannopoulos. Here's a little peek uh, at uh, what's in store for us. At Wayland Industries, it has long been our goal to create artificial intelligence, almost indistinguishable from mankind itself. The sci-fi pipe dream of moving pictures for as long as they've existed. But no dream to those assembled here. This wasn't a film industry gathering, but a conference put together by Singularity University, a futuristic Silicon Valley think tank which fosters and showcases high-tech inventions. The goal is to make the world a better place as fast as possible. Co-founder Peter Diamandis. These tools that are now in your hands allow us to really take on any challenge. It's about the most efficient use of capital and, and tools that have ever existed. Singularity's mission is to solve humanity's most pressing problems. By spurring new technologies in food, water, energy, supposedly scarce, but with the tinkerings of technology, says Diamandis, potentially abundant. We have the potential during our lifetime, in the next you know, 10 to 30 years, to slay water, energy shortage, uh, hunger, uh, health care, educational issues, where we can create a world of abundance, where we can meet the basic needs of every man, woman, and child on this planet. The key, says Diamandis, is that tech growth is not linear, one, two, three, four, five, but exponential. One, two, four, eight, sixteen, or even faster than that. The rate of innovation is a function of the total number of people connected and exchanging ideas. It has gone up as population's gone up. It's gone up as people have concentrated in cities. You know, the coffee shop is the location where people exchange and share ideas. Now, the global coffee shop is the internet. And the more people connected, the more innovation we have. Think about the fact that a Maasai warrior in the middle of Africa today on one of these cell phones has better mobile comm than President Reagan did 25 years ago. And if they're on Google on a smartphone, they've got better access to knowledge than President Clinton did 15 years ago. It's extraordinary. But says high-tech entrepreneur Carl Bass, we haven't seen anything yet. Within five to 10 years, we will be printing biological structures with actual function. 3D printing is already a reality. Copying machines that literally copy in three dimensions. Toys, product prototypes, and now living things as well. There's some fantastic work going on at Wake Forest where they're using that same technology of 3D printing and they've already printed a human kidney. It's not ready for transplant, but I suspect within five to 10 years it will be. This conference was filled with sci-fi-like eye-openers. The self-driving car has now been okayed in Nevada. So we can put your hands right here. Dr. Dan Kraft gave me an EKG, and with a stent installed, I've had a lot of them, with his cell phone. It's just a two-lead EKG, pretty basic, but I can see the basic things, that your heart is beating regularly, that your QR complex looks normal, that you're not having an ST elevation, which is to be associated with chest pain or an acute attack. Former astronaut Dan Barry said the day was soon coming when robots would provide all sorts of services, from the workaday to the intimate. Robot sex is going to be big. It, it really is. It's funny, right? But it's not funny if you're, if you're 75 years old and you just lost your partner and you are lonely and you're by yourself, you still have sexual drive and you have no uh, outlet for that. Among the best known inventors at the conference was Dean Kamen, whose innovations include this prosthetic arm. It freed double amputee Chuck Hildreth from total dependence, freed his wife from having to feed him. His wife is standing behind me at the time and starts to cry because she says he hasn't fed himself and now here he is. And she says to me, Dean, you got a choice. We keep the arm or you keep Chuck. <laughs> 
Now, Cayman and his cutting-edge contraptions may be familiar in that we've introduced many here on the News Hour over the years, from his medical marvels to transportation aids for overworked News Hour correspondents. Cayman invented the Segway. But for the past decade, Cayman's most ambitious project may be the slingshot, a device to make drinkable the world's dirty water. It is poison. It is toxic waste. Take water that's got fecal matter, cryptosporidia, gerardia, every other kind of organic toxin or inorganic. We said, let's make a box that's small and portable that you can plop down anywhere. A box the size of a dorm room fridge that almost instantaneously boils and then condenses water 250 gallons a day. Water that's so pure, it's equivalent to rainwater. It's distilled water. And we believe that if we can build these machines to scale at a cost that is, we think, highly realistic, we will be able to put these things all over the world where people that today have to make a choice between drinking something that will make them sick or possibly kill them and their children, or not drinking at all, which will surely kill them. That's not a choice people should have to make, not in the 21st century. Cayman has cajoled Coca-Cola into distributing these devices. First venue, rural Ghana, where they're now being installed. Eventually, slingshots could be everywhere. To Peter Diamandis, Cayman's project exemplifies the mission of Singularity University. Converting that which was scarce to that which is abundant. Abundance is the title of Diamandis' new book and describes his vision of the future. Transformations in water, food, energy. What people don't realize is that we're living on a planet that's bathed with energy. 5,000 times more energy hits the Earth's surface than we consume as a species in a year. It's just not accessible yet. But there's good news in this area. There are breakthroughs constantly in solar energy production. Last year, in 2011, the cost of solar in the world dropped by almost 50 percent. Admittedly, solar now provides less than 1 percent of U.S. energy needs. But Singularity University's other co-founder, Ray Kurzweil, whom we interviewed by something called Teleportech, says the public is pointlessly pessimistic. And I think the major reason that people are pessimistic is they don't realize that these technologies are growing exponentially. For example, solar energy is doubling every two years. It's now only seven doublings from meeting 100 percent of the world's energy needs, and we have 10,000 times more sunlight than we need to do that. One last high-tech frontier, meat. At the moment, livestock production takes up a third of the world's ice-free land generates nearly a fifth of the world's greenhouse gases via organic exhaust, front and rear. And eating just one serving of red meat a day, says a new Harvard study, correlates with a 12% increased risk of death. Enter in vitro meat, not to be confused with pink slime. We have the technology now, it's being done in a number of labs to actually grow meat products in the laboratory, in the test tube, so to speak. And people say, oh, yeah, it's disgusting. Have you ever seen how chicken McNuggets are made? But an in vitro hamburger doesn't sound like it would be good for you. Well, actually, these kinds of new food products will be far better for you because they'll have the, the best proteins, the best fats, the nutrients built in. It'll taste like a hamburger? It'll taste better than a hamburger. By this time, we were sufficiently wowed, if not downright overwhelmed. But keeping our journalistic wits about us, we posed the skeptic's question. To Vince Cerf, known as the father of the Internet, did he think this conference might just be overhyping the future? I have been surprised repeatedly by the things that we've been able to do that would have been thought to be science fiction in the past. What Craig Bender talked about this morning about creating synthetic life uh, it would have been science fiction. In fact, it was science fiction, and he's pushed the boundaries of what's real. But what about Craig Venter himself? The man who cracked the human genome in record time a decade ago is now hard at work creating new life forms for fuels, food, and vaccines. He surprised us by issuing a warning of sorts. Singularity's brand new world, he said, is not just around the corner. Most of what you heard here so far today is fantasy or bullshit. 
Venter was <laughs> venting for effect, perhaps, since he too is creating the future. But think of the world's growing problems, he says. If all these dreams come true, and I hope these people are right, then we will solve everything. Nobody has the solutions in hand right now. We have potential solutions. We don't have ways to provide the fuel. We don't have ways to provide the food, clean water, medicine uh, for 7 billion people now. How are we going to do it for 8, 9, 10 billion people uh, in the coming decades? How indeed. But here in the make-believe world of the future, you can be sure someone has started working on the question.